Uh, it'll probably upset them more. Um, great. So, um, today's talk is on uh, machine learning. This is my view uh, of the answer to the question, what is machine learning and uh, what is it good for? Um, so, I will put forward the view that machine learning is the 21st century's second answer to the question, how can we learn from scientific observations? And that may sound not very impressive, but actually I think there are only, uh, in my view, four different answers in total to the question, how can we learn from scientific observations? Uh, so for machine learning to be one of them, it's actually a pretty good, uh, a pretty good and potentially valuable technique. I'll talk a bit about um, the, other, um, the other approaches, which uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to decide that these uh, symbols or icons for the different approaches do make sense once I've explained what they all are. And you may already recognize what some of them are, um, but we'll, we'll, do, we'll do questions when we get to that bit. So that's what I'll talk about. Uh, this is, of course, my personal view, so I don't promise that it's the last word ever written on um, what is machine learning, uh, but it's an introduction to principles and a comparison with the principles of a different method. Okay, um, so the other principles are going to be Bayesian inference, frequentist or sampling theory statistics, and um, Aristotelian natural science. Okay, and then I'm going to talk briefly about some of the key methods in machine learning and try and answer the question, uh, should I or should you want to use this uh, for looking for learning from your work? Okay, uh, so before we start, um, the idea of machines uh, that learn is not a new one in the 21st or 20th century. So uh, they go back as long as people have told stories so that everyone's favorite 12th century monk, Roger Bacon, uh, was said to possess a mechanical bronze head, uh, which was able, depending on the exact story, it could answer correctly any question put to it, or it could say yes or no correctly to any question, or it was made by the devil and it would basically lie uh, in a subtle way in answer to any question. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of his uh, sketch of his apprentice uh, being shocked by the bronze head uh, answering some questions. So these stories about machines which learn are so old that in the 21st century people have to put a new spin on them. So here's a picture of Wheatley from the game Portal 2. And uh, Wheatley uh, was not just an intelligent machine that was able to learn, uh, but to make it more entertaining, Wheatley was designed to learn like a moron, so that from any situation he would actually learn to do something and it would be the wrong thing. And this, this makes Wheatley a funny uh, machine learning character. So um, the idea that uh, you have these intelligent machines is not new, uh, but what is the relatively new principle is uh, some of the ways that they can learn specifically. Um, and some of the important work on how do machine learns, how do machines learn, uh, comes from uh, this guy, uh, Leo Breiman. Um, so he wrote a paper which I think is a great introduction to this subject. Uh, he's a, he uh, was a Stanford professor, um, computer scientist, statistician. And uh, he said that um, emerging from a lot of the computer programming work that was being done where people without necessarily a focus on pure academic statistics uh, wanted to learn useful things from their data, so they wanted to do things like text recognition, um, he said that uh, there are these methods of machine learning, um, but they're a bit different to previous statistical methods uh, because their goal is uh, to solve problems. So we're using data to solve problems, and he says that something we're doing that's fundamentally different is we're moving away from a interest in data models, what he calls data models, what you can call models of the underlying true physics or underlying truth and just towards um, algorithmic models or this more diverse set of tools where the purpose is to make accurate predictions rather than to fundamentally learn exactly what is going on in a situation. So uh, this is a pretty good and influential paper I think on what is machine learning and then um, some of the tasks which uh, which are classic examples of what can be done. Um, you can ask machines, they're quite good at classification. So given some text in the post office which has been handwritten on a load of letters, machines can now look at that and they can read it most of the time. Handwriting is often pretty bad, so they can read it as well as, say, I can read text. Um, they can do a few 
ever come to the border, uh, you probably have been interviewed by a machine which has taken your picture and compared it with your passport records, and then it's let you in infinitely more politely and efficiently than the human staff. A machine is much better at doing facial recognition and generally being uh, courteous, or at least consistent. <coughs> I get myself thrown out of somewhere for saying that. Now, um, Machines are very good at classification, and they're quite good at predicting numbers. Um, so if you have a complicated chemical plant or a, uh, a medical uh, reaction which quantifies how well someone has improved after they've been given a drug, um, and that's going to depend on lots of different uh, input parameters or how the plant is set up or uh, what, the, what the person is, then um, making a prediction about how lots of different numerical influences will affect an outcome. That's something which machine learning is interested in. The, as I said, without necessarily understanding the complete physics of, the tr of, the, of what's going on. Um, and then I'll talk at the end about um, machine learning. So neural networks, a mathematical neural network as a model for explaining biological neural networks. That's what we are uh, thinking with, uh, or at least what I think we're thinking with. Okay. Um, so that's uh, some uses of machine learning. Okay, so an example problem to think about the difference between machine learning and uh, what Leo Breumann calls data modeling uh, is the game of snooker. So everyone knows what a snooker game looks like, I hope. So at the start, there's the break. And you can imagine watching a video of the snooker. You're watching the snooker on the television, and you see the break, and you get to this position. And the question is, uh, where will the balls come to rest? So in this case, uh, in this video from YouTube, the balls come to rest uh, in this configuration. And the task which you might need to address is, uh, given the first few moments after the break, can I tell you where all of the balls will end up? And there's basically two ways that you could do this. Um, data modeling would be something like, uh, given this first uh, split second, half second after the break, I can see the position of all the balls, and I can also evaluate the, s the velocity of all of the balls. And so if I uh, do data modeling, I've learned those underlying true parameters about the system. So I understand the the physics, and I also can have a guess at, of the balls, uh, what, um, to what extent are they rolling and to what extent are they sliding. I can try to get that from the video data. I can even attempt to have a go at getting what is the coefficient of friction of the cloth, or what is, and I can have a guess of what is the coefficient of restitution of the cushions. Given all of that information, all I then need to do is run Newton's laws forwards, and I can do a, a simulation from the physical truth of where the balls will end up, and it, it, say it's there. And I have no doubt that that could be done, and it could be got right, given video data. It's probably not how you would do it if you were an experienced snooker player. Probably how you would do it is that you'd say, OK, I've seen a break that looks like that before. So instead of uh, data modeling, I would say I've seen this before from experience. I know it ends up like this. Alternatively, um, I haven't seen exactly this break before, but I've seen the left hand side before. I've seen the right hand side before. And therefore, I know it's going to end up as some sort of conglomeration of the two results I've seen before. So no interest in underlying truth, uh, just matching, uh, just taking a prediction, which is a weighted average of what you've seen before. And that's the fundamental principle of machine learning, as far as I understand. Um, let's then look at what I think are the four approaches to how you can learn from uh, data or observations. So uh, number one, which I borderline say is the correct approach, uh, Bayesian inference. Um, so the, the maxim of Bayesian inference is what you know about uh, some situation after your data or observations arrive is what you knew before plus what you learned from the data. And uh, Bayesian inference is uh, simply um, the procedure of let's find some way of adding together those two apparently different bits of information. So for example, if um, somebody asks me, um, Eric, what do you know about tennis? Not a lot. Um, do you think player X will beat Rafael Nadal in the upcoming match? I say probably not. Um, and I would do that in a Bayesian sense. Uh, I think Rafael Nadal's quite good, so this red line might represent 
my uh, degree of belief in the, the proportions of matches that might be won by player X. It's uh, concentrated down in a low, a lowish proportion. That's, that's my information before the data arrive. Uh, and then if I would use Bayes' theorem after someone told me, well, as well as your prior belief, Zarek, I can tell you that in the last four matches between these players, they've each won two, uh, then I would update my prior beliefs and I would nudge them towards this blue curve. Um, and then I would make predictions. Um, so if uh, that, that's my, my AP distribution, well, it's my uh, posterior distribution for uh, what proportion of matches will be won by player X, and then I can use that and I can summarize, well, I think it's about a 0.4 chance that he's going to win the upcoming encounter. So that's the Bayesian uh, principle. It's excellent because it's almost a universally logically coherent method for inference. Um, the only thing it slightly stumbles over with is uh, radical uncertainty, uh, which is when you barely have enough uh, information to ask the question in, in a meaningful way. Okay, and because, uh, because of that, and because the um, result, my conclusion about the next match, seems to be strongly colored by my prior information, which some people don't like, they say that's bad science, um, you come up with the second school of thought about learning, um, frequentist statistics or sampling theory statistics, for which the maxim is, let the data speak for themselves. So take away that prior information and throw it in the bin. What we should be doing is we should be uh, taking just these uh, measurements, these black data points. And this is a principle that we could apply to, say, um, giving people some quantity on the x-axis, a known quantity of a drug, and then after the treatment period we measure their health on the y-axis. And in sampling theory statistics we say, okay, we know we have a, a rough model for the underlying truth of what's going on. We say that I believe their health outcome is uh, something which is some baseline plus something proportional to the amount of drug they've been given plus some random variation. And given this underlying model, I'm then not allowed to allow, I'm not allowed to interfere with my prior beliefs anymore. I have to instead invent estimators using the principles of sampling theory statistics, uh, which allow me to say, um, I can estimate how healthy someone will be after some future dose of drug X. Um, and all I need to do is work out these underlying physical parameters, uh, A and B. That's uh, A, basically the baseline of how healthy someone will be without the drug, and B, what is the proportional, what is the influence of some quantity of drug. Um, so if I have that sort of model, um, the idea is I invent estimators, they're numerical recipes, and the, one of the advantages of frequentist statistics is it's, um, it's very strong in these ideas of standardization, um, randomization, and repeatable testing. And it's very scalable to different industrial and medical statistics situations. Um, and therefore, it has become uh, one of the most important sets of methods. Um, it's got some philosophical weaknesses. It depends on good experimental design, um, which is the slightly unsatisfactory idea that you make an experiment repeatable without influence it without allowing your prejudices as to how it works to affect your conclusion. So it's, a, it's, a, it's slightly um, iffy in its basis, but Bayesian inference isn't perfect either. Um, and let the data speak for themselves um, neglects prior information. So if you have lots of industrial cases, that doesn't matter. That's actually quite appropriate because you have uh, maybe symmetric information either way. Uh, but if you have uh, really strong prior information, then um, frequentist statistics is missing out on information which Bayesian statistics uh, would give you. Okay, I have some longer examples of that in my data analysis course. Uh, but that's the, the key feature is that you're using numerical recipes in frequentist statistics. Machine learning takes this one step further. So in frequentist statistics, I say we're estimating um, parameters of some sort of underlying physical-ish model, where B is the amount of health improvement provided by a milligram of drug. So, um, and the purpose is we're predicting uh, what someone's health will be after they've been given some treatment. Machine learning says, uh, 
well, you can actually, we only care about predicting what the health will be after a particular treatment. So forget about your parameters. What we need is any kind of algorithmic model which accurately makes predictions about what the health outcome is and your so-called physically sensible A and B about baseline and response to drug is, um, is uh, not uh, allowing you to come up with the best um, estimate. Instead, I've written this equation here. So machine learning, this symbol here, uh, you've got your x and y. So uh, this symbolizes that um, given x, the information, your input information, which the computer sees inside its eye, um, it then has to tell you y, the prediction. And you don't care about having an underlying model of physical truth. In order to do that, um, you just uh, need to come up with whatever is the best method for doing that. So this is Broman. Um, uh, we want to solve problems. We need to get away from this dependence on underlying physical truth. Strengths of this model is that it can be very good for prediction. Um, the fundamental weakness of machine learning is that it's, um, it's deliberately uh, doesn't care about its interpretability. So it doesn't necessarily give you um, parameters which are easily understood um, once it's trained and it's come up with a method that works for making a prediction. Okay. So, and I've got this comment uh, from Brad Efron. Uh, I like this comment. He says, a third front seems to have opened up in the long-running frequentist Bayesian wars, uh, which has been uh, started up by the advocates of machine learning, who don't actually believe in any inferential school at all. So the Bayesians and the frequentists have a, an argument over whether or not your prior information is important or uh, should be kept aside as hard as possible. And the machine learning people say it's irrelevant because Actually, I don't care about how you get to underlying physical truth, only about how accurately you can make predictions. Okay. Now, that's the, the third school of thought, which is taken to a logical extreme, um, not being interested in underlying truth. So I can't then ignore the fourth school of thought about learning from data, or I'm going to call it the zeroth school of thought, Aristotelian natural science. So Aristotle writes a, a compelling description of what is natural science. And his description is that science is all about explanation. So he says the goal of science is to, um, it's to, it's to look at phenomena in the world and it's to explain them. And then once you've got some explanations, your goal is to take explanations which are poorly uh, ground, well, grounded in poorly understood principles and replace them with explanations which are founded on well understood principles. And he says also it's your goal to uh, take uh, theories which are explanatorily weak or anemic and replace them with new better theories which are explanatorily fruitful. So that's what he says. So for Aristotle, um, focus on explanation and underlying truth is everything. Uh, that's what we need to do in science. And interestingly, um, you, might, you might be about to say, so you're not going to be able to write down an algebraic equation um, to summarize the, the Aristotelian maxim about how you learn from information. Uh, but I will, uh, because one of the reasons Aristotle is a significant figure in the history of science is because he not only wrote down a description of what science was, uh, but he also invented meta-theory by turning the theory of science back on itself. So um, a meta, an x is a meta x if it's an x about x. So a theory is a meta theory if it's a theory about a theory. And having said that the goal of science is to come up with better explanations, Aristotle then reversed it onto itself and tried to work out an explanation of, in general, in the different branches of science, um, how are these explanations obtained. And the answer is he discovered that Explanations are usually obtained by Aristotelian logic, categorical and modal logic. So my equation isn't quite an equation to describe um, Aristotle's view on science, uh, but it's this diagram showing um, categorical logic or, um, for example, the method of working out from the true information, all Labradors are greedy and my dog is a Labrador, predict true, my dog is greedy. Um, so that's every S is P, or all Labradors are greedy. Okay. Um, so Aristotelian natural science is... So apart from some developments to do with empiricism and uh, the fact that uh, prediction and experiment are, are also important, uh, this is kind of uh, an important idea in how we do 
uh, scientific work. Um, methods that we have are logic. Uh, the weaknesses of the method is that we don't have numerical recipes as such uh, to take lots of numerical data and then hide behind the conclusions. Uh, we have to instead come up with really convincing explanations. Okay. So there are those schools of thought, um, and I've put them out like this. Um, so that you can see my view of how you go from, on the left-hand side, Aristotelian Natsai, Nats which is interested in explanation in uh, truth, and it has to be an interpretable explanation. And the schools developed since then which go more towards, well, okay, we've got that. Um, that already exists, but can we do um, things which make predictions efficiently at large scale? And we move towards uh, frequentist statistics and then machine learning as approaches which do gradually better at not being impossibly hard to think about, uh, but being able to be applied um, to different processes um, effectively uh, without spending a lot of time sitting like this and trying to work out what the hell's going on. Now, does everybody recognize this picture? This is your question. Uh -huh. Very good. It's a silhouette of Rodin's famous sculpture, The Thinker. How many copies of Rodin's sculpture, The Thinker, are there? You guys want to drink some tea? Talk amongst yourselves. Okay. So there's at least ten, um, but then more than ten is dodgy because the French government put out a, a long time ago, uh, put out a maximum number of copies of sculptures that could be taken before they were considered to be not, uh, not original sculptures. There's at least 10 proper copies. Um, okay. Oh yes, okay. So, um, as a comment on Aristotelian nuts, I, um, the uh, Roman uh, philosopher and speaker, Marcus Cicero, uh, commented that uh, if Plato's work, which is pretty good, is a river of silver, then Aristotle's writing is a river of gold. And so I can add to that, um, if machine learning is more like a river of ink. It's taking very large amounts of numerical data um, and attempting to learn from it, um, not attempting to figure out what is the one true underlying principle. Okay, good. Um, so there are some criticisms, I'm going to do criticisms of machine learning before I get to um, things I actually quite like about it. There are some obvious criticisms that follow from this. Uh, Richard Cox, a statistician, comes up with the obvious one. He says that this uh, machine learning takes a pretty defeatist attitude uh, towards attempt to formulate underlying processes or underlying truth. Is this not to reject the basis of much scientific progress? And I think it is, but... On the other hand, there are some cases where you can't make scientific progress using these Aristotelian methods, and you do need methods which work at scale. Um, Henri Poincaré, uh, good chap, uh, has this nice comment which is applicable to machine learning. Science is built of facts the way a house is built of bricks, but an accumulation of facts is no more science than a pile of bricks is a house. So that would be... A pretty harsh criticism of just telling your machine to find structure in something. Um, Brad Efron, by the way, I think is in favor of machine learning principles in, in methods, um, nonetheless says the successes of this algorithmic modeling or machine learning are no more an argument against traditional data modeling any more than splines are an argument against polynomials. Um, in other words, they do slightly different things. So this is where I got my idea that there are these overlapping but different schools of thought about how you do uh, data analysis. Um, Manuel Parson says, uh, two goals in analyzing data, which Leo calls prediction and information, I call science and management. So you can guess from that that he thinks that these methods for doing classification are pretty useful, uh, but you really need to do some more science after your machine learning has done its job and classified your data. Um, Possibly that's not quite what he means, uh, but he's um, commenting on the getting it. He's, again, I think that's consistent with my comments on getting it underlying truth versus um, producing uh, effective predictions. Okay, right. Okay, great. Right, so let me do a couple more examples. Uh, what are we doing for time? Three, four, six, that's fine. Examples. Uh, I like doing examples. 
So I'm going to give you some example tasks uh, to show uh, in which tasks can these machine learning methods be very useful and effective. I'm going to start off with a task where they're not going to be effective and you'll be able to see the difference uh, by contrast. So uh, this is a tennis court. And um, the task is, given that you're watching a game of tennis and you've got something which tells you the x, y positions where the ball lands and then you know whether or not the ball has been called in or out, uh, the task is, can you tell me what are the, what are the, what are, where is the edge of the tennis court? Where's the baseline and the sidelines? And this is a really simple problem. And we can say there's a known simple model with uh, there's a known underlying truth with very few parameters to answer this question. And so this is something data modeling is going to do very well. Machine learning might find pretty hard. How does data modeling work? So imagine you've got uh, these relevant uh, balls. Uh, the blue ones are called in, the red ones are called out. And so the question is, uh, where is, I'm going to, let me just answer, where is my sideline? And my data model, I know that my sideline is a straight vertical line somewhere. So I can do pretty well. I can say um, uh, Bayes' theorem, uh, here's my probability distribution for these in and out calls uh, given where the sideline might be. And I can see that, um, as far as I'm concerned, it's uh, uniform likelihood that the sideline is anywhere between uh, these uh, closest, uh, closest balls that were called in and out. And I use Bayes' rule, uh, get my posterior probability distribution for where's the sideline. Um, and then if I wanted instead to do sampling theory statistics, I could uh, do that the efficient way, which is to get the proper answer using Bayes' theorem and then construct a sampling theory estimator to say, uh, that's my estimate of where the sideline position is and I can work out an estimate of the variance too. Um, and anyway, the point is I get from a few balls and the calls, I get a pretty good inference about where the sideline is in this game of tennis. And I could probably use that um, to play tennis to whatever, to whatever ability I already have, not much. Okay. By comparison, if we ask a machine to work out where the sideline is without knowing the underlying truth that it's some kind of vertical line, it won't do as well. Depending on what method I choose, it might do, it might say this. I might use something called one nearest neighbor. That says that um, given my training data, I know which balls are in and out. Um, I will say that my future call of in or out uh, will be the same as whatever uh, bit of information I have that, that was nearest. Does that make sense? Good. Unfortunately, this ends up with this horrible region. So according to my one nearest neighbor from this limited amount of data, uh, without being able to benefit from the underlying um, principles, I infer that this red region is out and everywhere else is in. And if I play according to that principle, I will do horribly badly. The one thing that you can say is that you would at least <laughs> fairly quickly learn that you were wrong um, so that you could improve your, you could improve uh, by having more data. Okay. Um, that's no good. What about the Aristotelian approach just for fun? So the Aristotelian approach uh, would be to say, this numerical data is a complete red herring. Um, ignore the fact that you've been given x and y positions of the balls. What you have to do is get the ball inside of this particular chalk line. And I get this just by thinking more deeply about the nature of the game. Now, it's obvious from the game um, that uh, people are enjoying themselves and they're not spending their time doing maths. Uh, instead, they're, um, they're trying to see, um, can they avoid this problem of chalk flying? Well, can they avoid the problem of there being no chalk flying up? The purpose of the game is obviously, uh, just from looking at it more deeply, the purpose is to make chalk fly up and then um, tell everyone that this has happened. And this is good entertainment for everyone. And chalk has flown up, therefore the ball was in. You can learn that. So in other words, you have to, in the Aristotelian approach, find some deeper underlying truth about the system. So the calls are not being called, caused by the XY positions of the balls. The calls of in or out is being caused by the relation of the balls to the chalk line, which, which is the position of this, of this edge of the court that I've been asked to find. Okay, so those are some approaches for a very simple problem. When is machine learning going to work better than this? It's going to work better if I have um, not a simple uh, known model, but if I have a complex unknown model. So instead of now um, tennis, so this problem is um, I want to map an island 
from a few, a tropical island from a few observations. So here's a tropical island. This is Treasure Island from um, Robert Louis Stevenson. And imagine that um, in the book, instead of just having the map, imagine that the, the map of Treasure Island has been torn up in a fight and they just have a few scraps of the map left. Um, from a, and they have grid lines on the map, so they know that um, a few bits of the island I know are, um, I can look at a little scrap and I can say that's trees, and I know where that is because it's got a grid line, I can see what it is. Uh, I can look at another scrap and that's beach because I can see that it's yellow. So I've got a few points on the island which have known, um, known terrain, and the question is what does the island look like? So in that case, um, data modeling approaches are right out, because what would I need to do as a data model? Well, I'd need to, suppose I, was, I would need to be a geo, geoscientist of some sort, and I would need to know, uh, here's my model of tropical island formation, and I would need to take the observations of these terrain, and I would need to uh, use those to infer what are the, the physical properties that underlie the island formation. So I'd need to know that a certain quantity of lava has gone up, and I'd need to know that the seabed was sloping in that direction, and I'd need to know um, a lot of other complicated physical parameters. I'd need to learn that from a couple of observations of tree or beach, and from those observations, uh, then I, so w once I'd inferred the physical truth, then I can predict what the shape of the island is. But that's hopeless because I don't have such a model of the physics of island formation. But what I can do um, is, uh, what I can do is I've got um, these points. So I see these points are C, uh, there's a couple of bits of trees and some other things. And I can say, let's use this uh, one nearest neighbor I just described, one of the entry level bits of machine learning. And I say, I'm gonna say, in other words, I predict that all of the rest of the island has terrain equal to um, whatever is the nearest observation that I know about. So I take this suitable weighted average and I end up with that as my uh, smoothed, interpolated picture of what the island looks like. And in that case, that's done pretty good job. I mean, I have cheated because I've chosen um, representative points when I decided to put my points on the slide, but, well, the odds are that you'll mostly get representative points when you sample from something. So um, you can, um, without any of the ridiculous complexity of needing to do advanced geology, uh, you can get a good uh, effective map in a complicated situation, and that's not even the hardest situation to imagine. Um, so harder situations um, will be complex chemical plants or uh, bio, biomedical things, uh, protein pathways and so on, um, where these methods for making predictions without underlying exact physics, um, th these could be useful and effective. Okay, uh, what did I get to? Oh yeah, this slide is just um, because I got to this point and thought, well, I'll talk about all the methods in machine learning and then I thought I won't because it's Friday. So, I don't want to run into the weekend, and I don't want to run into the barbecue. So, um, I've talked about k-nearest neighbor, a, a smoothing and interpolation method. Um, a similar, another, a, a like approach, something to do something a bit more complicated, a uh, krieging. I can't not mention that. Um, so that's if, instead of for your island, instead of having observations of terrain type, if you had um, height above sea level at each point, Krieging would be a method of saying um, what is the, the volume of the island above sea level or what is at any particular point, what is the height above sea level. Um, and it would do that by taking not a nearest neighbor approach, but it would take a suitable weighted average of all the, the uh, heights that you'd observed um, with the, the observed points, uh, which are the known points which are closer to where you're asking about would be more influential in the weighted average. Okay. Um, so Krieging, it's not invented for doing height above sea level, it was invented uh, by a, um, a geologist in South Africa for doing, um, estimating uh, quantities of gold in, a, in, a, in an ore-bearing rock by taking, so it's not altitude measurements, it's gold concentration measurements in ore at a few points that you've drilled into the ground. But essentially the same task, it's given a few sparse measurements, uh, work out what the, the ore concentration is somewhere else. Um, I'm going to skip over a few things. Um, 
support vector machines are important, but I think what's more interesting is if we go to artificial neural networks. Um, before we do this, um, so here's one comment I had. Um, all of these machine learning methods, they, in, order, in order for us to use them, uh, what is important is that we first of all will have to have a way of taking our observation and turning it into basically numer numbers, numerical data, uh, before we can feed it in to the machine learning method. And I'll come back to why that's important. I'll come back to why that's important in a bit. Um, okay, so neural networks for character recognition. So the idea that you want to be able to get a, a computer to read someone's handwriting is not a new task. Um, so that, um, for example, if you have a look on the internet, you can find the Optophone, a technology from 1913, which uh, you scan it over your text and it produces a different sort of howling electronic noise uh, depending on the shape of the character which it's sitting over the top of. Um, so we don't want to use that because that is something which requires an intelligent human to interpret the noise to say what letter it is. Instead we want to say here's some uh, letters or some initials and let's use something, let's invent this thing called a neural network, say, for uh, saying uh, let's map each of these scrolls to um, a definitive numerical answer as to which letter it is. So a neural network um, looks like something this. So the first task is take a, an image, take the image data of the writing and convert it somehow into usable numbers. That's actually the, that's potentially the really hard part because depending on how well you do that, uh, that will determine how well your computer is going to be able to deal with the information that it's got. Um, so you need some sort of method of feature extraction. I'm only going to look at the simplest possible. And then there's um, training your neural network. So each of these orange things is a mathematical neuron, roughly inspired by a biological neuron. Each of them takes a number of inputs. It receives uh, an amount of activation or an amount of kick, which is some weighted sum of all of the outputs that feed into it. And then, uh, depending on how much of a kick it's received, it spits out some response itself, which might be read by a subsequent layer of neurons. Okay, I was not going to go into mathematical detail because I thought, what, what would people really like on Friday? They would really like, no, they would not like a slide on algebra for this. Um, but in principle, we want to do some process like this. Given some writing, scan and say threshold the data. I'm not saying thresholding the data is the best way to uh, convert the scanned picture into information, but you can imagine uh, that here's your uh, five by five pixel image data, and you can imagine that somebody has written in a J uh, which has those black boxes. So somehow turn your observation into numerical data. Um, your numerical data then is um, represented as this vector of numbers. So ones for white uh, squares, and it's 25, uh, 25 number long vector. Take some sort of um, possibly multiple step linear or non-linear combination of those input numbers and you want as your output, you want your Z, um, the neuron outputs here, uh, to be uh, a column which is zeros, um, so it's a 26, uh, there are 26 numbers in the output vector. Um, one for each character, and you want the one which corresponds to J to be a 1, meaning true, and the others to be a 0, meaning not true. That's what you want, and the question is how do you do that? Um, I've commented that um, you wouldn't necessarily start like this. You might do some sort of histogram of oriented gradients or some sort of complicated uh, image analysis task to get your input numbers. But if you did this, I have no doubt that you could adjust the connection weights uh, of all of your artificial or mathematical neurons until you correctly map um, cases close to a J into a J and at the same time map cases close to an M into an M and so on. Okay. Um, I was not going to go into the maths of how that can be done using back propagation. The point is it can be done. You've got a huge number of possible inputs, 25 pixels, so 32 million possible inputs. Um, quite sparse subsets of them need to be mapped into outputs 1 to 26 and I don't care what happens with rubbish so you can adjust the weights of these connections to do that by this process of back propagation. Um, 
one of the interesting properties, though, that neural networks have is um, you don't need to do what I've described there, which was supervised learning, where I manually adjusted these connection weights. You can instead invent a connection weight selection rule, and you can see what the neural network learns in this unsupervised way. Um, so, for example, and, and this is thought to be a good model of how your brain works. So if I tell you countries and capitals, Rome, what do you say? Italy. Very good. If anyone was being awkward, you could have answered Roman Empire or really awkward Vatican City. Okay. But um, associative memory, this is how your brains work. Um, if you have part of some information, uh, your brain will retrieve the rest. And that's surprising because that's nothing like how a desktop computer works. They use addressable memory. So if I want to know um, Italy, I would have to somehow construct the address to give to my computer, which contains the memory box, which contains the, the code for Italy. And um, biological memory pretty convincingly has this property of being associated. Uh, you can fill in some missing bits. So if I give you, depending on how optimistic I am, if I give you part of the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, you can fill in the bit, uh, which is where I've, I've not bothered to put in whether it's a, a del squared or a curl cross curl. And uh, you, you might be able to fill in that particular missing bit. At the very least, you can all fill in Italy if I tell you Rome. Um, <laughs> How is this achieved? So a mathematical network which has the same property as this Hopfield network. Um, and I'll demonstrate this and then say some people have used this as a possible method for diagnosing how effectively biological neurons are working. So the idea is that um, I want my Hopfield network to memorize these four uh, letters. So these are DJC Mackay's initials, and from his book he has uh, these letters written in a 5x5 five five grid. Uh, so there's 25 pixels, and those provide the inputs to a neural network. Um, the neural network has 25 inputs, it's got, um, and, um, it's got this rule for how its 25 neurons respond. So once you give them a kick, which, uh, say, a kick, a one, corresponds to a white square, the whole network then updates itself uh, by each neuron takes the, um, the response of its neighbors and updates itself. And without getting into the maths again, they have a rule for um, updating. Mm. Oh, it's gone cold. Right, thanks. Um, sorry, so you've got your your Hopfield network for learning um, these symbols. And the 25 neurons, they're mathematical, but biological neurons would do the same thing if they followed the response of growing more connections to each other if they're both activated at the same time. So that um, you end up with a strong positive connection between uh, the neurons which in each of the bits of training data are both white at the same time and a negative connection between pairs of neurons where there's, in each bit of training data, one's white and the other one's black. So given that bit of uh, the Hibbian learning rule, um, the Hopfield network has this property that given a bad copy of one of these letters, it will spit out a corrected copy of the letters. So for example, if you um, take the trained network and you're no longer um, training the neurons, you're just getting them to um, do work for you, you're seeing what pattern do they end up in, um, and give it a corrupted J and they will, in one iteration and in another iteration, they'll give you the, the correct pattern. So in other words, you're, um, they, they have this memory, they filled in what the, the structure should have looked like if somebody had not been so impolite as to tell you Rome without saying Italy. Okay. And they can do that, so the same network um, can do this not just for one pattern, uh, but for, um, depending on the size of the neural network, this one's easily able to do it for four initials. Okay. Um, and something interesting happens when you have an overloaded neural network and you try to give it too much, you try to train it with too much information at once. Um, it can sometimes invent new stable patterns which were not the original ones. So you try to train it with an S and 
five other things, and it only ends up with three stable patterns, say, and one of them is a sort of corrupted S, another one's a differently corrupted S, and it managed to memorize the D properly. Um, so, something that the, the neural network can do, which is thought to be like biological memory, is that it will invent confabulations uh, of different memories which you feed to it. So it can sometimes mix them up. So, for example, if you try to train a neural network with countries and capitals, this list on the left, and the network isn't quite up to it, it can, um, it can sometimes it can get some of them right, and then it will, some, it will get some of them wrong, um, and it will lose some of them entirely, and it will say Paris, Sweden, that's wrong, and it can also invent uh, new places. So it can invent um, the city Eknarf, and it will connect that with the, the, ca the, ca the country Syrap in this case. So how useful is that? Um, this is thought to be actually quite useful in terms of how does the brain work, uh, because it means that if you feed your brain uh, useful bits of information, you train it up with the information, I like tea and I like cake, then it might at some point re return to you the very helpful suggestion, I like tea cake. Um, so it's thought to be um, a useful thing of how imagination works is that um, uh, it, is, is that it can rely on the um, sometimes not strictly correct memory of um, neural network systems. Okay, so that, um, without the maths, is all I wanted to say about neural networks. Um, except that uh, here's a paper I thought was very interesting. Um, a couple of scientists, Mr. Pizza and Mr. Bear, I'm not going to try and pronounce their actual names. Mr. Pizza and Mr. Bear um, have trained a, a biological neural network, a Petri dish containing some neurons, to recognize, um, to recognize patterns. So they, uh, they have neurons which had been uh, manipulated so that when a light shines on them, they receive a kick, similar to the way that you would in that example of DJCM's initials, um, you would give the mathematical network a kick by just feeding in the ones and zeros for the black and white squares. Um, the biological neurons receive a kick from actually having light uh, put onto them. And they were trained, roughly as I said, so many times they were trained with um, an arrow pointing up, an arrow is pointing down left and right, and after some period of training, uh, they then looked at what is the um, response, what is the um, signal given out by the Petri dish into a, an electrode array when, um, when, some other, when some test pattern of light is shone on them. And what they were able to show is that decoding the, decoding the, decoding the electrode array signal was difficult, and they actually had to use machine learning for that. Uh, but if you trust putting um, layers upon layers of machine learning, which we possibly can, um, they were able to show that their neural network was able to, once it had been trained up with the different patterns, the neurons had grown together in such a way that if you showed it an up arrow again, it would correctly give you the response that classifies the up arrow. And so they would say, well, they would be able to use this to control some machinery, or the neurons could do some thinking for them. So what would be interesting about this, um, I think if we were able to build this, um, I think it's really hard, but if we were able to build this, uh, this would give you a measurement of how many patterns can my Petri dish of neurons memorize. And of course, healthy working neurons should be able to memorize at least Rome, Italy, and then if you drug them up, they should be able to remember Navier-Stokes equation, and it's got, it's got this double squared here. Okay. So, um, in principle, the number of memories that you could put into a network before it starts only returning garbage um, would be some amount for healthy neurons and many fewer patterns for neurons that were not working properly. So that would be, I think, um, something that would be useful for us. Okay, good. Um, so, I don't know, uh, probably everyone would like to go to the barbecue soon. So, um, can machine learning be used for real science? Definitely yes, in some cases. It's really good at classification. Um, 
in some cases, the method, if it's machine vision, is the product. Um, when it's really, when it's most useful, um, is when there isn't a simple underlying physics or true model of what's going on, uh, but you think there is some sort of complex underlying process, then the machine learning gives you an algorithmic uh, method for predicting what that complex process does without you needing to understand it in some sort of Aristotelian satisfactory way. Okay. Um, Yeah, I'll do one of these two warnings that I have on machine learning. So the question, should I, as a student, learn machine learning or should I learn uh, sampling theory, statistics or Bayesian inference, is a bit like the question, should I learn Spanish or Portuguese? Well, the answer is they're overlapping and they're quite similar, but most people will only need to learn the one which they need to work with um, for wherever they're going to live. Um, Nonetheless, learning one would make the, the other easier, but I think it's probably true that most university departments, they'll be quite happy to offer you a language option in your fourth year, but they won't offer you multiple language options. They might, they might not be happy to spend the time learning all the different methods. Um, I hope that if I've uh, given you my view of the principles of what those overlapping methods are, uh, that will help you to, to decide which uh, method is the, is, is the most relevant one for you. Okay. Um, and the second warning, so domain knowledge is important. Um, so a, a very important part of the machine learning analysis was turning your observation into meaningful numerical data. And the um, business of having scanning in your pattern, your initial or your arrow sign, um, just like that, is not necessarily the most useful way of taking an image and turning it into numerical data. Uh, there are other Fourier transform-based methods uh, which, which might be more useful. Um, but, this, but actually, the business of quantification, so standardizing your experiment and turning it in, into numerical data, um, that's, that's really hard and that's useful in itself. So it's not necessarily true that uh, modern work is made better purely by machine learning or other statistical analysis. It's in some, to some extent made better simply because people have had to standardize their process and make it numerically quantifiable and that's made it better on its own even before they've done any kind of analysis at all. Still, both of them are important steps and if you want to learn more about them um, you can learn about the industrial quality engineering practices like um, Six Sigma, which I might do a talk on uh, in the future. Um, okay, and then I've got to uh, references, uh, some of my favorite books on statistics. Um, Jane's is my favorite book, and then Mackay's book on uh, neural networks and inference uh, also is a classic. Um, and then some acknowledgements for the talk. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, so probably you might like to go to the barbecue fairly soon, but I'm quite happy to take questions if anybody wants to ask anything. I'm also happy to take criticism if I've completely garbled anyone's view of what machine learning is. Um, my arrow back to power is that what this is easy for you is it's difficult for robots oh, yeah. and vice versa in the last meter problem. Would you have any relevance to this to machine learning? Mm. That's a good question. What do you think? Okay. Oh. <laughs> I made a strategic blunder there. I thought I thought that might be a longer question. Um, so what? Um, so so the machines in question are your uh, computer desktop computers with addressable memory. Um, and I guess the people in question are the the people with associative memory. Um, so there's a, I, I don't know, but there's a quote from John von Neumann, I think, an uh, uh, early important mathematician, computer scientist, um, said that um, you say that there are things which uh, humans can do which machines can't do, uh, but if you can tell me precisely what it is that uh, you think machines can't do, I can always design a machine to do precisely that. Um, so um, his view, I think, is that um, given sufficient... Uh, given modern computer power and uh, computers with addressable memory or von Neumann machines that uh, uh, can implement where useful these machine learning techniques, they'll be able to do uh, 
every, he, I think his view would be that they would be able to do everything we can. It's just about man to go everywhere. Yeah, I think that yeah. would be his view, yeah. that the, the computers um, will catch up with us in everything. Okay. And I, for one, I, for one, welcome our new overlords, um, especially if they're going to be checking my passport at the border. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you can have it. It's a relatively long question. <laughs> long question. Yeah. So as you said, like, there's kind of two types of way to crack a question. So if you can have a physical model or you can base, like, let the data talk by itself. But for scientists, we are more interested into the underlying law or the principle behind it. Mm -hmm. So for example, like, the most famous AlphaGo would be the best, like, Go players in the world. Mm -hmm. But we try to understand why they play like this. Is there like any principle like that? Or for example, in our like for a chemical reaction, we want to know like why we predict this condition will be good, and is there like law we can summarize it? So do you think like we can try to understand the statistics model, where is it like we can use Bayes like combined with the neural network like BN, which is quite famous now? To just try to interpret the statistics model we have based on the data training. Some of the machine learning models are very interpretable. So there's an example in, um, oh, whose book is it? Um, no, this is in Bryman's paper. Uh, the example is, uh, he designed this analysis of, um, so court cases in the United States were taking a woefully long time because, of course, the legal system grinds as slowly as you might expect. And he was commissioned to do an analysis of why the court cases were taking a long time. And um, so he invented something called a decision tree. Uh, this is a, a very interpretable model, which takes what are the influences uh, which lead to the total time taken by a court. And he put up a slide and he said, well, I, and he wrote in his paper, I didn't really want to uh, flag this up because this could embarrass people. But one of, the, one of the key branches on the decision tree was, is the case being heard in District 19? And, <laughs> and this caused a massive delay. And he didn't mention it. And he was working out of the seminar afterwards, he heard one of the judges saying to another, I knew those guys in District 19 were dragging their feet, lazy blighters. Um, so some of the machine learning methods and decision tree, very interpretable. Um, the neural networks, I think, not necessarily. Um, so if you want interpretations, there probably are recipes that are geared to produce them, I think. It's just a flow chart, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like the idea of getting the tree to answer yes or no. Okay, okay. great. Oh, I guess everyone is very satisfied then, so um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.